Hello and welcome to Azure Databricks with R, a deep dive. We're going to be talking about how do we use the R programming language and specifically the Spark R interface package to Spark. And as Databricks is really a wraparound Spark, then what we're really talking about is how to use R within an Azure Databricks notebook. So we'll be taking a look at that. And my name is Brian Kapke and I am a Microsoft Data Solutions Enabler. My job is to help people understand all the different products and services Microsoft offers in the space of data, AI, machine learning, and that type of thing. And I want to start, and I've done this in other videos, but I always liked it level set because I, if you don't understand uh, the idea of scale out, then everything else becomes a bit moot. So I want to step back very quickly and talk about two ways that things have been done in the past to get more processing done on computers. The traditional approach, which was going on for decades, was just keep adding more memory, adding more space, adding more computer chips, uh, CPUs, and that's called scaling up. You've got one box, and you just keep adding more and more resources to that box. And that's kind of like the guy on the left, Barry, here, who does a lot of weightlifting and everything else and keeps getting stronger and stronger, but there is a limit where Barry just can't do anymore, right? He's, he's only one person, after all. But what if we could, instead of using one person, what if we took a task and broke it up among a group of people. So in the picture here, imagine we have a phone book and we want to find anybody in the phone book who lives on a street named Main Street. We don't care where Main Street, just as long as the name of the street's Main Street. One way we could scale this out, in other words, get more help on this, is to take the last name of each person, take the letter, first letter of the last name of each person and break it up the phone book and give that section to a different person. So all the A's, Applebee's and Adams, etc., go to one person. B's, C's go to a different person. So B's, C's, each person gets something, a different letter. And so each person would only have last names that start with a single letter of the alphabet. And then they'd say the instructions they get, the program, is search for anyone who lives on Main Street. And so they go through. Now, because one person is only tasked with a single letter of the alphabet, they're going to get done a lot faster than a single person trying to look through all the letters of the alphabet. So it happens a lot faster. And we could even go so far as to say, let's just set up a, a larger network of people where we give each person a single page to look at, right? That should go really quickly. And the person who's making a request, we'll call him the cluster or her, the cluster manager. And each person would be called a node. So we've got this whole idea and the collection of the nodes and the cluster manager is called a cluster. So that's kind of how I'll map it out. So it's easy to visualize to me when, I'm, when I can do concrete visualizations. If I think of each person handling a task, now I just have to say, instead of a person, think of that as a computer. And there's gonna have to be one computer that's orchestrating and coordinating. So that would have been like me in this sort of job with the phone book. So that's you know kind of a, the key thing to understand. That's scaling out. Scaling out means we're going to use more than one machine. We're going to use a collection of machines to get work done. And interestingly, the basically what we found is that when we scale out, it seems to be able to be done pretty much indefinitely. There's been no limit that I've seen yet uh, in that they call linear scale, that you can keep adding more and more machines. And the it will take somewhat longer, but it's a consistent thing. Whereas on a single machine, what happens is it hits a wall and then everything just sort of stops. But with linear scaling like this with scale out, it can keep adding more and more and get really good performance. And we're talking into the range of like data petabytes and eventually zeta bytes, I guess, and all these other bytes. So let's now that we've got that out of the way, I also want to clear out something else. You've probably heard of Hadoop. And Hadoop is a bit confusing because there's like two Hadoops really. There's one Hadoop, which is a product, an actual open source data platform, which is uses scale out to read data and then separate it all out and do what I mentioned in this description with like the phone book, separate it out. It's called partitioning when it separates the data into chunks and each machine only gets a chunk of data or partition. So Hadoop is one product in a sense or one data platform uh, software. However, when Hadoop started, it was that one thing, and then other people came up with other technologies that relate to it or similar or whatever, and those got added to the Apache Hadoop project, which is really a, an umbrella, okay, a container that holds many projects, not just Hadoop. And so that can be very confusing. So when we talk about the Hadoop project, we're talking about this. 
There's more to it than just these. There's actually been other things added. This just gives you, believe it or not, a subset. And when we talk about Hadoop itself, we're talking about that middle area. So you see the little elephant on these things, the Hadoop MapReduce itself. MapReduce is a process where it separates the data, pushes it to the nodes, and then brings it back and consolidates the, the data that's returned. Yarn is the uh, yet another resource negotiator, I believe is what that stands for, believe it or not. And basically, it manages resources that are being consumed by the Hadoop process. And HDFS is the Hadoop file system. And that automatically is a very cool thing. When you copy data to it, it actually will break up the files into chunks like we talked about and distribute it on many computers. But it does it in a way that you don't even see it. It's sort of hidden behind the covers. And then you have additional products that were added to Hadoop to do other things. Because Hadoop originally, everybody pretty much wrote Java to work with Hadoop not the language everybody wants to write with. So they added Hive. Hive gives you an SQL interface to Hadoop, so you could use SQL. And then Pig is, was added to support ETL. Mahout was added to support the idea of distributed machine learning, so you could have training of machine learning models at a massive scale. So that's Hadoop. And you have other things that were added later. Okay, So you have Cassandra and HBase, which are NoSQL, massive scalable database type structures. No SQL, though. They're not focused so much on SQL, and they're used for various purposes, but again, that massive scale-up. And you have Zookeeper and Storm and all these other things. Storm is more for streaming support, and Flume is, is also something related for streaming, and Kafka is a queuing service, and Scoop is for ETL to SQL, and the list goes on. But I want to really call your attention to Spark, because when we talk about Databricks, we're talking about Spark and Spark only. I've got a, a video I also did an HD Insight a little bit about creating HD Insight clusters. When you create an HD Insight cluster in Azure, one of the types you can create is a Spark cluster. There's also one you can do, which is machine learning services, which creates an interface on top of Spark. So it's also a Spark cluster, but it uses machine learning services with Spark. This is important because that's the focus of our discussion and I want to clear up any confusion because people say Hadoop this, Hadoop that. When we talk about Hadoop in this presentation, I'm assuming it's it's the the Spark we're talking about is part of the Hadoop project to avoid confusion there. So that's just Spark. When we talk about Hadoop specifically, I'm referring to I would I would be referring to MapReduce Yarn, that center type of open source project. Now, one of the things that Spark did, Spark was developed completely separately. It really has nothing to do with Hadoop, aside from the fact it also uses that scale out methodology. It's a lot faster than Hadoop. Hadoop is one of the, the oldest. It's the original. That's why it's called the Apache Hadoop project. It was the first one out there. Awesome idea. Great job. It scaled out and was able to support distributed processing and has a lot of uh, support for resiliency so that if something fails, it can keep going. It doesn't just crash. Really good stuff. However, it didn't think out all the needs that would be required by people. Once you said, OK, this works. It's good scale. Now we want to use it here. We want to use it here. Um, I don't think Hadoop really had all of that in mind when it was originally written. In other words, it was really written for software engineers for use by software engineers. Spark came up with a different methodology. It's a lot faster. First of all, Spark said, well, can we be faster? It was actually developed. Uh, one of the founders, co-founders of Databricks wrote Spark. One of the first things about it that's very notable in this key takeaway is Spark is all in memory. So when Spark pulls data in, it's like a vacuum. It sucks all the data into memory. And then it, it's, and again, partitioning. So each computer is holding the data you want to work on, but in its memory, instead of reading and writing to disk, which is what Hadoop does. So it's a lot faster. It can be up to 100 times faster just because it's all working in memory and it's a different architecture. The other thing that Spark does that's different is out of the box, instead of like an add-on to say, oh, we, we want to use SQL and we can't really get at this without Java. Spark was started with the idea from the very beginning, we want to make sure it's very accessible by tools. So the first thing given is we're going to build SQL right into it. So you can get in Spark, create it on premise if open source, HD Insight if not, or whatever, and you can do SQL right off the bat. And it's a very comprehensive SQL. It's an ANSI standard SQL. So it's not some small subset. It's, it's full blown SQL. The other thing that Spark did is it added, it, it included a graph API. So if you want to do that networking kind of structure, like Mary's connected to John's, connected to Tom and Harry, et cetera, and network through, or maybe it's a geographical kind of network, it's supported within Spark. 
It also has streaming support. So if you're doing Internet of Things, the IoT kind of stuff where you've got massive amounts of streaming, or it could be anything, it could be click streaming or something, then Spark is also able to scale out and support streaming, and it's got a built-in streaming uh, interface. And finally, it's got something called MLlib, which was more recently added. It wasn't, I don't believe, part of the original Spark. Uh, but what it did is it, it allows you to scale out massively your machine learning model training. Because if you want to train something, like let's say you want to do a deep learning neural network training, you might have petabytes worth of images or something you want to put through. And the libraries of Python or R, the open source libraries, were not designed to scale out. They just don't. So they will fill up your memory on your local machine and typically crash. Uh, if you have five CPUs, 10 CPUs, 20 CPUs, they ignore all of them and go to one. Uh, and they don't, they'll, they'll fill up your memory aside from that, uh, but they don't know how to do parallel processing, et cetera. They weren't written with that sort of intelligence built into them. So when you do, when you can go to MLlib, you're gonna get that scaled out intelligent processing that can handle a petabyte of data and not crash. So really important stuff there. We're gonna focus a lot obviously on that because one of the other things that Spark allows is for languages to interact with it using what's called an API. So if somebody creates an API for any language really, then it can work with a Spark cluster in a distributed mode without having to worry about the internals of how it's doing things. And so we do have uh, built out of the box when you get Spark, you will get Scala and Java interfaces to Spark. Uh, it's actually built on Java as we'll see, and Scala is really an abstraction more or less of Java, so it works really well with both of those. Python and R, as we'll see, can be used, but because the user community took it upon themselves to develop APIs for Spark. It was they said, we'll write an API. Python is, is an extremely hot development language, so it was first. It came up with PySpark, and I'm gonna do a video on that too, how PySpark works. It not only did it come out first, but it was the most comprehensive interface aside from Java and Scala to really interact with, with Spark. So R lagged a little bit, but eventually Spark R came out. And what Spark R does is adds a lot of great interactivity with Spark. We'll also see there's something called Sparkly R, which is uh, complementary and yet a bit competitive with Spark R. And I'm not going to get into it too much here. I think that's yet another video because we'll be here forever if I can't isolate certain topics. All right, so let's go forward, but I just wanted to kind of level set some background before we get into this. So a lot of times with Databricks, there's some confusion. Like what is Databricks and what is Spark and what's the difference? So I'm gonna try to clarify that as much as possible. When we talk about Spark, this slide and the previous one I kind of highlighted, but this slide talks about this is what Spark supports, okay? It is powerful, it's got a lot, it does not bring you any more than this. So it gives you this massive scale Spark engine and can support any number of machines that it needs to coordinate. It has SQL built into it. It has MLlib API built into it. So you can use, and you can use uh, Java and uh, Scala with that. And using libraries, you can interact with Python and R as well to Spark. And you get the streaming graphics, etc. So I just want to be very clear, when we talk about Databricks, all of this is included. If you picture that, you know, if you picture your set of, I want to, it's a weak metaphor, but I'll, I'll just try to give you a sense of it. Maybe you have, I'll say a docking station, let's call it a docking station. If you had a, a laptop, if you ever had a docking station, the laptop is a laptop, that's the resources, that's what you're using. But if you plug it into a docking station, you may get a bigger monitor, a printer, uh, all kinds of utilities, maybe extra, maybe you've got a hard drive to the side you've plugged into to get more storage. That's the kind of concept if you think of Databricks. Spark would be the actual laptop, but all these accessories you plugged into, that's Databricks. So there, Spark is completely self-contained within Databricks. And I'm gonna kind of highlight that in the next slide. Uh, and by default, R and Python are not supported in Apache Spark, but as I mentioned, uh, people wrote libraries to allow you to, from R and Python, connect into Spark. All right, so let's go in here for a minute. This slide is meant to really emphasize that point. On the left, you see in Azure, when you go to the Azure Databricks uh, service, you go in to your service you've created, and you go to the Azure Databricks workspace, and here's where you can put your notebooks, you can run jobs, you can create clusters at a point of a click, etc. And that's what you're getting, okay? But I want to be very clear again, it is an add-on, a wrapper, 
sort of like a docking station to Spark. Maybe another metaphor would be your remote control controls your streaming or your, your TV, but it is not the TV. Um, and, it, and anything that works with your TV still works with your TV. Now, why I really want to emphasize that is for a couple of reasons, but the most important one is the Azure Databricks documentation may not be comprehensive. It may not cover everything you need to know. That's okay. Anything that is true of Spark is true of Databricks. I'll say it again. <laughs> Anything that's true of Spark is true of Databricks. Now, I've used this myself to great um, ability, if you will, because knowing that when I can't find the information like, well, how do I write code, let's say Python, to work with Spark, instead of being limited by the Azure Databricks documentation, I can go to the Spark open source documentation and it has loads of information about the API. Now, there are sometimes some nuances that Databricks is trying to make it easier for you. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, you walk up to your car and the car automatically opens the door for you because it senses your key fob or something is there. Sometimes Databricks is doing a little more for you and that might mean you don't need certain commands and it may not like them in the Databricks notebooks. But whatever works in Spark, whatever that core language stuff is, will work fine. So it's, it's not difficult. I think you'll see to figure out little tweaks that uh, Databricks is going to do. There's things like setting context and things in Spark. You don't need to do that with, with Databricks because it just assumes this. And why can it do that? Because it knows the only thing Databricks will run on is Spark. You, can't, you don't have any other choice. Um, Spark itself can read from anything. So you're, that's, again, why Spark is so cool. So if you've got you know, a data lake and you're using uh, you know, Azure, we'll say Hadoop HD Insight, and you've got a Hadoop uh, HDFS system somewhere, there's no, you can absolutely read it from Spark and do what you need to do. Let's go to the next slide here. So to kind of highlight, so what are we getting with Databricks? And I, I, I'm going to go back to that sort of docking station, although it's a weak metaphor in the sense that docking station gives you a lot less than Databricks. But if we think of Spark as being at the center, what are we getting? That whole menuing system I showed you on the previous slide, what are we getting for our money here? Well, first thing, and my favorite thing is creating Spark clusters is not a trivial task. You're talking about potentially creating a thousand virtual machines under the covers, actual machines that you're going to want to distribute work to. So there's, you can certainly get books and manuals and do this on premise and learn how to configure and set up Spark clusters. You can go in and make it even easier on yourself and you say something like HD Insight, which allows you to, through the menu or some other things, create Spark clusters and you've got some adjustability to it, et cetera. Uh, but in Databricks, it gives you a complete GUI to go through and you can just click, click, click. You can dynamically scale. I, I did another video that's an introduction and overview of Azure Databricks. So please take a look at it. Talks about this. Uh, but you can actually say, well, I want from two to a thousand, two thousand, whatever I want, virtual machines under the covers. And I want you to figure out when to increase the low, you know, how many units I'm going to have, how many machines. And I want you to turn it off after 10 minutes if I don't use it and stuff. So. I can have the compute completely shut down when it's not being used for say a half hour, whatever I set it to. That's all built into Databricks, which means I'm not gonna pay for those resources if they're not being used. So there's a great, it's ease of creating the clusters. It's just point and click. So even I can do it really easily. Uh, and it also supports uh, preemptive multitasking or multi-threading. So it allows you to really share clusters. Again, Spark itself ain't so good at sharing clusters, but Databricks adds some functionality around it that allows you to really effectively and efficiently share clusters. So that's the first piece. Uh, the other piece that I'll go down is security. In Azure Databricks, you get Active Directory integration out of the box. So it, when I go into Databricks, you'll see when I'm demonstrating, it knows exactly who I am. It's authenticated through Active Directory, basically role-based access. I can basically add people in and say, you can edit my notebooks or you can't. And I can do this at many different levels. So I could, for instance, say that Mary Jane, she can uh, not create clusters, but she can start clusters. And I can do that on a cluster by cluster basis. She can start this cluster. She can create clusters. If you make someone an admin, then they pretty much have open book and they can do what they want. So I have that kind of granularity. When I'm in notebooks, that's my programs. I can say, I want to collaborate with other people, but you know, these are maybe junior level people. I really don't want them changing my notebooks. They can certainly copy them, but I don't want them making changes to these notebooks or maybe they're gold copy notebooks. I can let people read them without letting them change them and stuff. So they get all that kind of granularity. And also we'll talk about other things, uh, but that granularity and security is really big and it's a value added. It's not something Spark gives you out of the, out of the starting gate. Uh, the other thing we have, I'm gonna jump past is notebooks. 
Notebooks is a program. So that's, we got it here. That's our Databricks IDE, our integrated. You can schedule notebooks and notebooks can call other notebooks so it can be a hierarchy. The scheduling tool allows me to actually within Databricks have a job scheduling system. So again, very powerful. And the collaboration ability, the security, as I mentioned, but also I can add many different people. So people can do that and I've been doing more and more of that and it's, it's worked out really well that, wow, you really can collaborate. And, and if there was a one takeaway uh, I'd want to say about Databricks, Databricks is designed to be a comprehensive, secure, uh, big data, data science collaboration platform. A lot, <laughs> a long sentence, but that's what it's really designed to do. So it's ultimately meant for data science teams. There are other use cases people use for ETL, massive ETL, et cetera. But the, the, the ideal use case that leverages all the pieces of Databricks is, is data science, machine learning, training teams, that kind of thing. So let's go full back. We, we got that idea in your head, hopefully, of still like the, the network of people, me asking this group of people, you know, look through the phone book. Let's take a better look at though how that really looks in terms of sort of more, more technical looking architecture here. So the, they have at the top a driver program. So think of that as being like me or somebody saying, or somebody asking a question, hey, Brian, can you get the answer of how many people out there who live at Main Street? Okay, then, um, then I am going to hand it out, split up the data and push it out to different machines, people, you know, we're using as a, a metaphor, hand out to all these people. And the cluster manager manages all that, gets the results back. The entry point, in our case, the Spark Notebook, or a program would be the context. Now in Databricks, it kind of hides the Spark context from you, as we'll see, it, you don't really have to know much about it. If you were using another interface, say a Jupyter Notebook to work with Spark, then you would set the context and that becomes the entry point into Spark. It's a little like if you're working on a network and you're sitting on your C drive, you know, DIR, or you're looking at folders on your C drive, and suddenly you, you switch over to a network drive and it might be like a UNC path. Now you're in a different context. Now I'm looking at network machine resources. Other people could be pointing there as well. It's not the same as if I'm sitting locally. And it's a little like that with this. We're setting the context here to be, I'm now working within this Spark cluster. And there's a lot of requirements and things to manage that correctly. So when I'm in that context, there's a certain way I interact, etc. The nodes run Java virtual machines. So What's actually running each machine is JVM, hence Java, which is why Scala and Java are so easily supported within Spark. And so we can see that each uh, node is doing things. Now, a key takeaway also is that when we want to distribute work in Spark, we need to push the programs to the data. That's the key thing when you talk about scale out. Instead of the typical old style was, I got my program over here, let's bring massive amounts of data into my program and I process it. Instead, we move the programs to the data. And since the data is sitting on many different machines, potentially, I have to move a copy of my program to each machine. Now, if my program was written in Java, not much of a problem, right? Because you can just see it's got the JVM already there. It's ready to go. A lot easier for the cluster manager to push the work down. And I, I will point out, too, lots of different data sources supported but to pull data in. But when we talk about R, um, we got a problem because R code has to be copied to each node. Well, I don't see anything in here that tells it how to use R, right? It doesn't have an R compiler or anything here. It doesn't have or the R interpreter. So how's that going to work? Well, we'll get a little bit better look at that. But the bottom line is through the API, R is able to actually push its work down to these nodes. And that's the magic of Spark. So kind of looking at this pretty gooey design here. We can see that there's the languages above that you can work with in Scala. SQL is built in, but you can do Scala and Java, and those are the most fully functional. If you're do, doing Databricks, it's worth using some Scala. Scala seems to be able to do everything you can think of, and there's good examples typically in it. So I, even though I like R and Python, sometimes it's just easy to use Scala a bit and just cut and paste somebody else's code and tweak it if you need to. Uh, but sometimes Scala will do things that's not that easy. My own personal preference with Databricks is use whatever works. So I really love, I like Python and R. So I love the fact that I can kind of leverage both in different ways in the same notebook. But if you don't want to do Python, you want to just focus on R, that's fine. But I would suggest, you know, being open to using sometimes Scala or Python just when you absolutely have to, because there may be something that you just can't quite do in R. Okay. So we see the same design here, Spark Data Frame API. 
And I wanted to call attention to that because when we talk about Python and R working with Spark, something that was added uh, 2.0, but I think it was 1.6 or so and above, they started this idea, they've added into Spark support for a data frame. So if you've used R, you know R has data frames. So the people that's developing the Spark code said, wouldn't it be great if we had support for data frames built into Spark? That way, as an R or Python developer, they have data frames too, you could interact with a data frame, which is much more intuitive to an R and Python developer than trying to use the old legacy uh, RDDs, which are the resilient distributed data sets. So I'm not even gonna to talk too much about those, look back, but you don't need to worry about RDDs anymore. That was not nearly as intuitive. Now you can use data frames that look and act pretty much natively the way you expect. They're not native though, they're actually data frames implemented in Spark. And the API part is, is a way that R and Python are able to interact with those data frames. So request data frames to be created and manipulated. And kind of emphasizing that a little bit more, you, you can see here, we've got Apache Spark and right on top of Apache Spark is the Scala slash Java API. So Scala and Java expose an API, which can then be used really Scala and, and, and the VM exposes an uh, API that Spark can, and that R can use, that Python can use, that any language exposes an API. So the external programs can leverage what it can do and they can do it in a way that hides that complexity from the consumer, the, the programmer like me. So Spark R is a package written in R that interacts with the API for Spark and allows me to get features and things in there. Uh, PySpark is the Python one, and there's another R one called Sparkly R, which we'll talk about in a different lecture. And you can see also C Sharp has an, an overlay into this that also allows it to leverage PySpark and has APIs directly against the Scala Java API. So .NET and C Sharp can also interact with Spark. So that brings us to what is an API? Well, let's start with the acronym itself, an Application Programming Interface. All right, so that means that application programs are, are going to work with this. It's not meant for typically an end user directly to use the API. It's when I'm gonna write a program. A uh, very common API right now is called the REST API. It's meant for like web applications to be able to easily call a service on the internet. So the idea is, and I'm gonna to kind of simplify it. Imagine I wrote some really cool functions. I'm a really sharp programmer. I wrote a function that can add any two numbers you want together. And I'm so proud of this function. I want everyone to be able to use it. But there's a problem. You know, I wrote it in specific language. Uh, maybe it's compiled. How do I allow other people to leverage this function? And the answer is I provide a way to interact with it. And that's what an API is. I, I expose my function to the external world through, through a set of uh, uh, technologies to make it easy to connect. So an example would be ODBC is a perfect example. Years ago, Microsoft started ODBC as a way that if you could connect to any database or whatever, and as long as they were able to expose themselves as an ODBC interface, it could work with it. So that's really the idea. The API, you don't have to really get into the details of what it's doing and how, but just understand that somebody wrote something and they intentionally exposed certain services so that they could be consumed. Okay, that's it. So it's, the idea is it provides a standard way to call exposed services and the implementation details are hidden from the calling program. So I, when I use ODBC, whether it's in a program or, or setting up something like a DSN on Windows, I don't really think about ODBC. I don't have to know how it does what it's doing. I just want it to work. And that's, you know, use your remote control. That's kind of a, a human interface to something. How do I interact? And that's, I don't care how it does it. I just want it to do it. So the calling program can, and, and I wanna add a layer to this. Uh, not only does the calling program not have to understand the details of how it's implemented behind the scenes, but they can hide the fact that it's even calling the API to the consumer, to the user. So when you're in a GUI, uh, you may click something and that web app or whatever can do something behind the scenes calling an API to do work for you, uh, like call Spark, and you never see it either. It's hiding it as well from you. And that's kind of an important detail as well. You don't want to have to make it really clunky and hard to work with. Now that we know what an API is, what does a Spark API do for us? First thing, it lets us load data into the memory, into the cluster with, with, with Spark. So we can interact with Spark and say, go to my Hive setup over here, Hive cluster, go to a, a blob storage, whatever, and bring this into memory so I can work with it. Once it's in memory, I can read and manipulate the data. And I can also, and a key thing of this is maybe inherent, but we'll see it's not always going to be the case that it has to do this. 
but I can push processing out to all those nodes. So that's, again, searching for Main Street on all these different machines. That's something I need to be able to make sure I can do that, If with, whether it's with R or Python or whatever, make sure that I'm pushing it out to the nodes instead of working on one node. Um, and we'll see also, though, you can, in the case of R at least, uh, you can, and Python, you can say, you know what, I don't want to scale this out because I want to use the open source code. The open source code is not designed to be run on multiple nodes. It wouldn't understand how to coordinate and pull the data together. It assumes everything's in one place. There are times when we want to use that. Maybe you like the library ggplot2 or something. In a case like that, you can bring the data back to the head node, one node, and then work with it as if it was just on a single machine. And a key thing about the Spark API that I really like is because it exposes the API in this way, people were able to write PySpark and SparkR and SparklyR, and those allow us to use the languages we know and love without having to get into the complexity of how to deal with Spark. Now, if you go back prior to, again, I think the cutoff was around 1.6, get to the early versions of Spark, you had to really have a better sense of what Spark is doing, and they used those RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Sets. So it wasn't quite so seamless. But with the new uh, packages and modules that are available, like Spark R, you get some really nice feel. You can say, I don't want to know about Spark. Truthfully, you do have to know something about Spark, which is why I'm giving you this background. But you don't have to know a lot, and you can stay in your comfortable language. So what kind of processing can we do when we push processing to the nodes? Well, the first when Spark R first came out, it really just worked essentially over the top of the SQL built into Spark. So it was all data wrangling. There was no support for that machine learning distribution stuff, or very, very little. And MLlib is necessary if you decide, I've got a petabyte of data, and I want to use it in training a model. So that's where MLlib comes in. When we talk about, and, and not to mention the graph API, etc. So when we talk about using Spark R, PySpark, etc., one of the things we have to sort of get our, our heads around is that what parts of the API have been implemented by this module. So PySpark implements some, but not all, most, actually. Most of the SQL interface and, and most of MLlib is supported by PySpark. But some of the graph stuff and some of the pieces are not, and some other pieces, it's still not everything. Uh, so again, that might be a case where if you really want something it's not there, you could use Scala or something to do it. But it's kind of key to keep in your mind what you're doing, what you can push to the nodes, and what you can't. So did you give you a little bit of a picture? What does it mean? We're using API, but we're using different languages. These three languages, not R in this one, but Scala, Java, and Python, you can see code, all of which interact with Spark, and they all use an API. And for the most part, the the API is, is basically an exposed object hierarchy, right? It's an uh, object class hierarchy that you can use and leverage. Uh, so looking at Scala, Scala, when you want to declare a variable, you say val, you give it a name, and then you say equal. And notice that one difference I've noticed in the three here is that when it does the non-empty dot count, Scala doesn't put parentheses around the count function, but the other two do. Uh, only Java puts a semicolon to terminate the line. And But uh, overall, the logic, if you look at the code, it doesn't look that different. Okay, that's a key takeaway as well. It's not that different because it's built on the same API. Just like if you worked with .NET, you'll find that if you write VB.NET or C Sharp or anything else with .NET, um, you really don't see that much of a difference in terms of interacting with the environment in the .NET library. But again, it, it's comfortable because it's in your language. So take another step back. The Apache Spark API. So we've got the Spark R architecture here, and uh, the link below, trying to credit people as much as possible, uh, so follow the links, etc. But I like this diagram by Databricks, because it shows the driver program and then the worker nodes doing work. So that's a JVM, and then it's going to the data sources. So if it's Java wearing a JVM, how do we support R? This slide is great, shows you. It's like the driver now has R. And it has an R backend, so it's got an overlay ascension to the JVM. And then it pushes your R programs down to the JVM, but it's able to operate through the API with R and manipulate the, um, the API to do things in Spark for you. So you are able to essentially push R now down to the nodes. It's not really native to the JVMs to support R, so it's going to have to work through the API to actually give you services. But what do you care? It works. That's all I need. I don't really need to know everything about it. 
All right. This slide is another good one. It's in our notebook later because I, I kind of confiscated a notebook somebody else wrote, and I will credit them because it's a really good notebook. Uh, but in this slide, what I want to kind of show you is the idea you've got the Spark Core engine, and I mentioned resilient distributed data sets. Uh, so the key thing, the resilient word means if any of these machines fails, it's got redundancy built in, and one, another one will take over, so you'll never crash, and things should always work. So it's kind of nice. Above the resilient data, distributed data sets, you can see Spark SQL is built on that. The ML lib is built streaming and GraphX. So these, these are essentially our four APIs, our four services that are exposed. Um, above that, we can use the SQL language, which rides on top of Spark SQL. We've got now support for data frames and data sets. Uh, so they use data frames, and data frames is a direct mapping and functionality in terms of how we do things in R and Python. All right. When we look at the Spock R library, notice it's crossing over and it's showing that we can cover SQL well and we can cover data frames well, uh, but it doesn't go into the ML library. So the Spark ML and the ML lib, it's stopping there. Now, in reality, this is a bit old and it has been extended to cover a lot of ML lib since then. Uh, but I wanted to show that this is the way you can conceive of what's covered and what isn't. And streaming and graph don't seem to be covered at all by Spark R. It shows Python, Java, and Scala going across the whole board. So it's got good coverage. Still may be places where you've got to go to Scala to do certain things. So as I mentioned, there's more and more support with the machine learning library. So, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this because you've probably heard of Spark R and Spark R. Spark R is newer. It was written by, uh, started by people at R Studio. And it's, it's original focus, and I think still main focus, has been like around the data wrangling side. So it, it kind of takes in the tidyverse. So going through here, Spark R was the first interface to Spark for R. Uh, Spark R is focused more on the data wrangling, though I have seen it also does support ML lib now. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, and both can be used, but they're not 100% interoperable. So as of this recording, I went in and got the link is there for you to get an updated version. But this shows you how many uh, training models have been pushed into Spark, are supported now by Spark R. So pretty good, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. They've added a lot in recent times. And this shows you, if you go to the Apache Spark, and I mentioned, uh, whatever Spark supports, Databricks will support. So this is, uh, there's a link at the bottom. And these slides are all out on github.com slash bcafferkey slash shared. So go out and, and get these. Uh, but uh, and the code as well and there's a notebook that you can import from here that will have all this but you can see here like there's a lot of methods and things lots of functions that you can get that uh, scale out and this one I particularly highlight is collect when you're done with all the work you've done on the nodes collect will bring your data back to one place where you can work with it so if you want to do like ggplot2 or something on the one node you could do that Okay, and I'm not going to get too much into, uh, you know, I go in here, I've created this service, and I'm just going to launch my workspace, which I did. I'm already in my notebook, clusters are started. I'm going to jump right in. I've already taken a lot of time giving you the background, so I'm going to bypass all that. Look at my other videos for background on Databricks. There's one that's a great Databricks overview, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, looking here, I want to credit this link. Uh, let's see. I'll push it for a minute. And this link is person Neil Dewar. He wrote this notebook. I want to credit him. I'm not trying to steal anything. Um, I did have to update it. It's a couple of years old. So it's about two years old now. But it's a really great notebook because he really highlights kind of like he was excited about R, then a little disappointed in the Sparker interface. And he did a nice job like kind of outlining the steps. So I'm going to leverage that. I was going to write my own custom one, but then I'm like, this is a really good notebook. It uh, was written by Databricks. And again, Neil Dewar, D-E-W-A-R, wrote this. Follow the link. It's in the uh, the slides for this. Okay. Having done, hopefully giving proper credit where it's due. And it's he's also listed in the notebook itself. So I'm br I brought it in to play with it. And here you have a link in the notebook. If you import it, you get a link to the Spark R documentation. So have it that. And I mentioned here that uh, we there's some changes due to some, some things changed within how Databricks supports some of this. So I had to make some changes in here. Now, I'm in a notebook, and again, you can do all kinds of things, copy files. So if you wanted to import a notebook, you can go in. I can export this notebook, and it would go out to a DBC file, and then you could import it uh, in Databricks somewhere else. And you get all these other things, permissions, et cetera, you can sign. So remember I said you can do permissions, and you can see that I can assign permissions to people for my notebooks. Okay. Now, if you're not used to notebooks, please go back again. 
oh, excuse me, watch my demo. But you can see that each cell in a notebook has a magic at the top that tells it what type of process is this cell, what type of code. Percent MD means markdown. Uh, so this one is just documentation and shift enter will run that code. Other places it will actually have executable code. You have uh, some drop downs here that allow me to navigate the cells, etc. And I can do all kinds of cool stuff, but let's kind of work our way through. So we saw this diagram already. Now you know where I got it. And I like that it's kind of talking about, this was again, December, 2016. So it's really outdated in terms of what Spark R supports, but go at it and take a look at it. There's also some things he talks a lot about um, setting a Spark context. If you're in a Jupyter Notebook, I believe you'll still have to do this. If you're doing Jupyter Notebooks outside of Databricks, um, then you would use that. But Databricks kind of builds in a lot of that support, so you don't have to really do that. Um, so one of the things that because Sparkly R came along, uh, it looks like they've made a requirement that you import specifically which one you want to use. For a while, it, it actually was just assume Spark R and you didn't even have to tell it. Now, I'm not going to have to use a magic command for my R cells because I've made this an R notebook. So when you create the notebook, you can say, what's the default language? And that means if you don't tell it a language, it assumes that. So it's assuming R. Now I'm going to shift execute here. It's going to run that command. And that means it pulled this in. And one of the things it didn't tell me, which it should have, um, but it, it can mask commands. So one of the things that happens when I bring in Spock R is there are certain functions that would have been using the open source versions and now it's not. Okay, so if I want to use the open source versions instead of the one Spock's overlaying, I can use the name of the package. So like ggplot2 or something or base colon colon and then the name of the function I want. So you can still get to them. But by default, certain functions will be uh, sort of masked over, it replaces them. All right, so I'm gonna run this code right here and, and I'll walk through what it's doing. So I'm gonna shift enter. First thing I'm doing is I'm using standard old, good old open source R, create a good data frame using a vector. So I'm using the C function and I'm calling, I'm returning this into RDF. RDF stands for R data frame, meaning it's an open source local data frame. It is not distributed. And then I can say columns in this and I can give it my columns. So I'm just giving it a column name. Here I'm doing a different command. I'm saying create data frame. That's a Spark, Spark R function. And that will return a distributed data frame. And that's why I call SDF. It's a fairly common practice. And I, I personally think it's a necessary one that when you're working in uh, either Python or R for that matter, and you're trying to create, you're gonna create local data frames, which exist only on the head node, the one you're interacting directly with, or you're distributing it, prefix them some way. The standard for R has become, create it, put SDF for Spark data frame, RDF for R data frame, okay? Because you, you can do certain things with one and not the other. So R data frames can use all of the open source code, but they can't use any of the Spark functions. And conversely, Spark data frames, which are distributed over the nodes, can only use Spark functions, not the open source code. All right, so we can see here, um, how do I know which one I have? Suppose I can't tell, and this is where, why it's good to prefix, because maybe you created, you know, my small data frame, and then 20 cells down, you're doing something, and it's giving you an error, and you're like, why is it doing this? Is it a Spark data frame, or is it an R data frame? The str command is useful, because it has been extended to recognize Spark data frames as well. And you can see, so I think that's the Spark version really, uh, data frame here for the first one, RDF, but then it tells you that it's a Spark data frame, the second one, SDF. So that's a way you can tell one way out of the box. Uh, when you run things too, you'll notice that you'll get messages from Databricks that it ran Spark. Uh, okay. So here we're gonna kind of look, and again, these notes are all from you know the author. But uh, I can take a look at STR from empty cars. Empty cars is motor cars. It's an old data set built into R since the beginning, I guess. And it has information about, you know, mileage, et cetera. So it's one of those training data sets you play around with. And it's telling me it is local. And now I'm going to take the motor cars, empty cars, and I'm going to push it out to the nodes. I want to put it into Spark over the nodes. I'm going to run this code. And you can see Spark is running because you can see this whole thing submitting it to the cluster, right? 
and you can see it's running and it comes back because I did the str afterwards. It's a Spark data frame. So again, kind of demonstrating, I'm saying create a data frame and I hand it an R data frame to do it. That's probably not the best way to create a, a distributed data frame only because in this case, it's already on the local node. It can't be very large if it's able to be held there, but it, it is a way to do it. Now, suppose now we have something like MT cars, which we've created and we've called S, uh, SDT cars, uh, Spark data frame cars. If we want to pull it back, we can take what's in SD cars here and use the collect function and the collect function will return a local data frame. That's the takeaway. The collect function is a Spark function, part of Spark R, that is going to apply this filter, and it's going to only do it if the MPG is greater than 25, and it's going to return it as a, a local R data frame. So you can see it's actually going out and querying the nodes. And again, we can see it's a local data frame. All right, so. If I just run empty cars, it just displays the empty cars data frame here, which is the R1. But if I do SDF cars, slight difference here. It's now going to the nodes, because remember, that's the distributed version of the data frame. And notice it doesn't just give you a display of the values. It just tells you about it. And it also does tell me, yep, that's a Spark data frame. So the display statement is meant to work with Spark cluster nodes. So when I do display, this is this is Databricks, not Spark. It's Databricks, but I can do a display on the cars, and it gives me a nice little grid, and I can you know I can do things with this. I can say I really want a line command, and it does all that stuff. So that's designed. This is all designed for Spark. It wouldn't work with a local data frame. Okay, you get a lot of good notes here. This is one of the reasons why I wanted to borrow this notebook because he talks a lot about these things like clusters and what are you doing with clusters and how do you use them, data frames, et cetera, jobs, all these key, key takeaways, loading big data. Um, and there are some really important ones. When you're going to, you know, here's a really important one. There are times when you will need to take data back from the nodes to do something. Maybe you want to do a specific open source function like, uh, you know, I use one called Psych to do like this grid uh, correlation matrix. And since it's open source, I, can, I have to bring the data down to a local data frame to work with it. So that's an example. But you have to be careful because if you try to pull in a petabyte of data to the local node, you will crash. You will get errors and you may wait a while before it errors on you. So you don't want to do that. You have to always be conscious when you're working with R and Spark that whether you're local or not, is this a local data frame or is it distributed? And I like what this, uh, the triple S that the author says here. When you're going to bring something to the local node, sample, subset, or summarize, all right? Meaning these are ways to avoid crashing the head node or overloading it. Sample meaning, okay, you got, say, a million records. Well, maybe take 10%. You can do a sample, get 10% of those rows, or filter it somehow, or use a subset to, to filter it and bring in only what you need, or you could aggregate it. So maybe you've got a billion rows, but there's only, um, say, their, their data about 50 states. So maybe you could aggregate it using Spark and get 50 rows back, now it's very easy to pull it back and work with it locally. So I mentioned function masking. There's a lot of cool things here, and, and the author talks a lot about that. But the key takeaway is some functions that we all know and love in R will be masked over in Spark, and they, they may work exactly the same in terms of coding syntax, or they may have slight differences. So it's worth sometimes knowing when you're using functions what that is. And this this, again, this notebook talks a lot about that, like using GLM and whether it works the same locally, et cetera. So it, again, you have to be aware of that and it can be a little point of frustration. The nice part about Spark R is it lets us use R and, and kind of hides from it that we're doing this when we're doing Spark. Uh, the downside is it's not always clear what is Spark and what's R, what's standard R. So that can be a little on the confusing side. So again, I, I recommend uh, you know taking a look at that piece. Another really important thing, if you use data frames, and I, I have tried this and now I know why it didn't work, but uh, so data frames, you can do direct vector indexing. So you can say, I want to bring in a data frame and I want uh, row three, column four or whatever, and I can specify the, the items I want. Does not work in a Spark data frame because if you think about it, there is no row five. Which which node? There's a row five on, on 100 nodes. Which row five do you want? And there's no way to really consider one having priority to the other. 
So that does not work. Uh, and there are ways you can do filtering and stuff to get around that if you're looking for a specific thing. But again, it's gonna, it takes some getting your head around a little bit of the pieces. Uh, and here's an example using sampling. So you can use a sample function. And, and, here's, and it shows normal sample in R would be this, but in Spark R, it's this. So you say with replacement as an actual parameter name and fraction in C. Um, some of these things, I don't know why they made slight differences where they probably could have just kept the syntax the same, but that's what they did. Uh, and then you, but these are ways that you could reduce data sets to go local. And so this, there's some slides here. The idea of uh, when you're training data, you wanna do a model training, you typically have to split the data up towards a test, a training data set, and then the one that is used to validate or test the data set work, the model works. So here we have this. This is one way that the author is suggesting you can use, which is a random split, and then you split the two up. And uh, we can do that if we run it. You know, you can see how it's basically, it's like a 50-50 split almost that he's creating. So this is one way we could kind of get towards that training versus uh, test data for, you know, data sets. Uh, here's another one kind of similar, but uh, it's using a split and creating uh, with more than two data sets. So here it's breaking into three ways. So the takeaway is play with those uh, cells and think out how you would want to do that because the typical method used um, that I typically use with R is using the more direct vector references and then saying, yeah, give me everything that's not in the list of train of the training set to get my test set, etc. Won't work with Spark. So you got to find a different way to do that. That's really the takeaway. And finally, this is method two. Um, just using a random number to filter which one you're going to get and you can see like here so what we're doing here is we're uh, setting up a random number and then we're just pulling out the training data set and the test data set and we're doing it based on the random number we got back okay and in here so if it's less than this okay and this is something um, by the way, a really cool thing in cells is if you go down here, you can uh, you can hide. Notice there's nothing up above there. If I say show show title, I get this nice ability to put a descriptive title on a cell. So I don't have to always do a separate markdown cell, which I kind of like. So there's another way you can do this separating of data called using the accept function. So it's similar to how I would typically do it with local source based R use the sample command and get my training set and then say, okay, now give me the test set that doesn't have any of the training ones in it. Uh, but it's, that doesn't scale well. It's doable, but it would be extremely painful for these uh, to be done on the cluster. So don't do it. Uh, but it's there for documentation. You may see it out there, but you will probably run into a lot of trouble if you get into using that. Again, we can do visualizations with uh, display, for instance, of SD cars. And uh, I can change this to maybe a pie chart, not a very good pie chart because it's a little crammed. Uh, but I, so you get all these things I can play around with. I could do a, say a line chart maybe. So all that good stuff. So again, you got the visualizations here. And okay, so what I wanted to show here is a really nice way I like to get data out of uh, spark into a data frame is to use sql so i can load files directly into blob storage i can load them in databricks and i can show that in a minute and then i can just use sql this sql function which is a spark function and select from that what i want so i have this birth weight table and i'll run this and now this sdf birth weight is a distributed spark data frame for r and I can do start doing work with it. So I find that the easiest way to get at data. It's, it's nice because I can use SQL and I can do SQL to do a lot of manipulation and, and prep for the data and then just extract it using this function, okay? So again, I'm gonna use Spock R here and I'm saying create a replace temp view. So this is a way to take, okay? So up here, I created this, I got this birth weight data frame. I'm gonna take that and now I want to do the opposite. I've done all this work as a data frame. I want to make it visible as a SQL table. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to use create a replace temp view, put in my distributed R data frame. And here's the name. I want to call it as a table. Okay. 
And now that I've done that, I can query it with regular good old SQL. And to be honest, I've covered a lot of stuff, but if there's two places that you can really get a lot of value out of, it's just understanding those two things because I've just shown you how I can take anything that's available in SQL, which is pretty much anything I want to be, and use that to create an R data frame. And then I've shown you how to take what's in an R data frame and make it available to SQL. With those two pieces alone, you can pretty much get anything done in terms of data wrangling because you can do things in either language and then interop between them. So again, just use the SQL function. In uh, Python, I think it's like spark.sql, not SQL, to do the same type of thing. But again, that's because the SQL layer is exposed. Okay, And this is doing the opposite again. It's, it's creating a temporary table which is only available for the session uh, in that case, but it's available and I can play with it and do things with it. And another way that was creating a, a temp view. This is called creating a temp table and it registers it. It really has the same exact functionality as the other way, but it's when I can tell uh, the other way is the newer, cooler way to do it, but they both work at this point. Another way to create a, a local data frame in Spark is I'm doing the SQL as before, but I can I can say collect and then nest any kind of retrieval logic I guess I want. In this case, I'm using an SQL statement, and the collect will tell it. In, normally, remember the SQL statement before was going to return a distributed data frame, but instead it's going to because of the collect it's going to return a local data frame, and I can prove it because we can see now that's a regular data frame, not a Spark data frame. I can't remember what this was for, but OK, so that and oh, and I can prove it because I just showing you what it did. So here I'm, I'm doing an aggregation and then returning it back. So this this is a good example of maybe I have a lot of data out there by using SQL and then aggregating the data. I can get a lower volume back and now it's reasonable enough to pull it right into the collect and push it into a local excuse me, local data frame. And once it's local, why might I do that? Maybe I want to use this slick bar function and uh, and do this. So I'm using R against it and do this bar chart. Not the most advanced graphics, but uh, you could use whatever you want just to get the idea. All right. So that's the basics of using R with uh, Spark. I hope I've covered a lot. I Again, I want to really credit the person who wrote this notebook. I do have another notebook that gets into more details, but I think I've covered a lot. So I do want to thank Neil Dewar, or Dewar, however you say that, um, for writing this because it, it really is a great job covering it. It was, again, as I mentioned, there are certain things that changed from when he wrote it to now in terms of Databricks, but it's a great coverage of the subject. All right, so that covers our introduction to and deep dive really of R with Spark. Say seven years ago and, and just what's going on under the covers, you really come to appreciate the value of this. So kudos to all the open source developers that have created all these great things. And, uh, and Databricks, I hope also, I kind of showed that you can use all these things and there's a lot of value added there as well. So please subscribe, share with your friends, uh, get value and come back again. Thank you.